the Exorcist. The movie is fiction. But our story is true. It's based on long lost journals and the memories of an old priest who was there. The Exorcist hits the big screen in 1973. Something beyond comprehension is happening to a little girl on this street, in this house. A man has been sent for as a last resort to try and save her. People line up around the block to see it, then throw up and faint in the theaters. They rush back to religion. Catholic churches report a sudden run on the confessional. People want forgiveness for their sins. Author William Peter Blatty, writer of the movie and the novel on which it was based, is astonished by the reaction. Suddenly it occurred to those of faith, weak or strong, that, you know, <laughs> there might be demons, there might be punishment. His story about a priest who drives Satan from a malevolent child is inspired by a real exorcism that took place half a century ago. The exorcist is a 52-year-old Roman Catholic priest in St. Louis, Missouri. William Bowdern is respected for his kindness and charity. Over 25 years in the priesthood, he has earned a reputation for tenacity. He was kind of like a bulldog. If he'd get a hold of something, he'd follow it to the very end. He receives a call from a longtime friend, fellow priest Raymond Bishop. He relates a story that seems preposterous. A woman suspects that something evil has taken control of her teenage son. Can Bowdern, with his experience and Jesuit education, help? Instead of dismissing the woman as a crank, Father Bowdern makes a house call. He's not himself. He meets the distraught parents at a small house in St. Louis and learns about their troubled son, Richard. Thank you for coming, Father. Tell me about Richard. Things are happening to him. Things we don't understand. I'm frightened. Bowdern calmly takes her back to the beginning. The mother describes an ordinary, happy, close-knit family. He's again. <laughs> As usual. Richard, an only child, has never been in any trouble. My sister-in-law, Millie, came for a visit in January. She and Richard were always very close. Let me show you how to use a Ouija board. Okay. Put your hand. She brought him one of those talking boards, a Ouija board. Let the spirits move it. Like this? That's right. Millie and Richard spent hours playing with it, trying to make contact with spirits in the beyond. Can you hear us? Spiritualism is essentially the belief that not only when we die does the soul go on to some kind of afterlife existence, but that it's possible for communication to take place between the living and the dead. January 15th. The first mysterious sign, a steady, dripping sound. It came and went every night for seven or eight nights. There are no leaky faucets. The family is baffled.
On January 26th, the family learns Millie has suddenly died. She wasn't sick. We didn't expect it. Richard was devastated. It was the first time someone close to him had died. In the days that follow, the nighttime thumps and tappings increase. It's upstairs. Not again. Better go see. They suspect mice, but an exterminator finds nothing. The family wonders about the paranormal. Could this be the work of poltergeists, the noisy ghosts of legend and folklore? The thought crossed my mind that it was Millie, the spiritualist, trying to make contact from beyond. One night, a holy picture rattled on the wall as if it was being thumped from behind. It wasn't Richard playing a prank. He was in bed. It starts off with lots of um, phenomena which are interpreted in terms of uh, possibly poltergeist activity. So it's alleged that uh, objects are thrown around the room or fly around the room. Um, it's claimed that there are mysterious sounds which people can't explain. This unsettling and surreal activity suddenly takes a frightening turn. It moves out of the walls and into Richard's bed. Mom! 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 Oh my God! Richard! It seems to have a life of its own. We took him to the doctor. He couldn't find anything wrong. He said Richard was just high strung. That is a term, you know, that we still use today, but it doesn't connote good mental health. It indicates someone who has anxiety, maybe depression, but certainly irritability and anxiety. To Father Bowder, it looks like a normal case of a rambunctious boy going through puberty. But it's not just him. We all saw it. Then the marks started coming on his body. Uh, Mom. Mom! What is it? Let me see. It begins on February 26th, a month after Millie's death. Is there a spirit in this house? We tried to contact Millie on the Ouija board. It says yes. The whole family accepted this belief, and no doubt when the aunt actually passed on, they were expecting some kind of communication from beyond the grave. If you're Millie, prove it. There's a response, not on the Ouija board, but again on Richard's body. Oh, oh. Richard, not again. Long, burning welts appear on his legs. Richard's desperate parents now consider the unthinkable. Perhaps their son is in the grip of something demonic. They turn to their pastor, a Lutheran. Let's pray. Psychiatry and science and medicine could not give them the answers they were looking for, and it didn't change Richard's behavior one iota. So they abandoned science because science couldn't help them at that time. Our Father, Lord, Lord in heaven. But neither could the minister. Thy kingdom come. Evangelical Lutherans, which this boy's family was, do not have any history of dealing with the possession and exorcism at all. Uh, but he knew that Catholics do. The minister's advice? Find a Catholic priest. Amen. 
if we accept the case at face value as it's often presented, then it seems to include lots and lots of elements which characterise possession cases. Do you think it could be? We'll begin the prayers tomorrow night and see what happens. The next day, Father Bowden returns to Richard's home. This time, he brings a witness, the priest who was contacted by the family, Father Raymond Bishop. to recite for you what is called a novena. Okay. So we'll start like this. Most amiable and most loving Saint Francis Xavier. In union with thee, I oh. reverently... Oh. What is it? Oh. Oh, oh my chest. Oh. Uh -huh. oh, my goodness. This to stop. I implore thee to obtain for me the, the greatest blessing of all, that of living and dying in a state of grace. The prayers continue from midnight until dawn, when Richard falls into a fitful sleep. The exhausted priests return to their rectory. The next day, Bowdern makes a daunting and ominous decision. The boy is possessed by the devil. The kind and gentle parish priest must do battle with the Prince of Evil. He must become an exorcist. Father William Bowdern is about to become a key figure in the frightening real-life drama that inspired the exorcist. The thrashing, cursing boy seems to have the mark of the devil on him. Bowdern, a former army chaplain, will once again go to war. He went to see the Archbishop in St. Louis to get permission to uh, use the prayers of exorcism. But you have to, you have to do that. You can't just go out and exorcise someone. The Archbishop makes one demand. He told him that he wanted a day-by-day a -day account of everything that took place and all the things that he did. Father Bowdern appoints Father Bishop as his assistant. He will keep a day-to-day -day journal of the events to come. Bowdern must now learn the steps of this strange and seldom used rite. He consults the Rituale Romanum, a 400-year-old Latin how-to book for the rituals of the Catholic Church. Buried deep in its pages is a section describing how to perform an exorcism. The signs of possession are the following. I'm going to speak with some facility in a strange tongue. The faculty of divulging future or secret events, displaying powers beyond the subject's age. For Bowdern, this is uncharted territory. Exorcisms are almost unheard of in the American Catholic Church in the 20th century. In Catholic Spain, 
the church still occasionally permits exorcisms. Among the exorcists is Father Jose Fortea, a parish priest. Demonic possession is a very, very unusual phenomenon. You can see thousands and thousands of people with psychiatric problems. And only one case in thousands is related to demonic influence. In St. Louis, Father Bowden believes his case is real. He arms himself for the coming struggle following the strictures of the Rituale Romanum. Let the priest pronounce the exorcisms in a commanding voice. He ought to have a crucifix at hand. If he notices that the person is experiencing disturbance in some part of his body, then he traces the sign of the cross over that place and sprinkles it with holy water, which he must have at hand for this purpose. Bishop returned to Richard's room, ready now to do battle with the devil. Deus nomina tua salva me. Let me go. And in a two times two way to Tika me. From Father Bishop's journal, his blows were beyond the ordinary strength of the boy. Get away from me. Deus et Pater Domini, Nostri Jesu Christi. Invoco nomen sanctum tuum et clementum. The prayers continue hour after hour. Then, just before 1 a.m., open the window. Are you all right? He seems about to throw up. He's going. Who's going? He's going. Who's going? What's happening? There you go. From the journal, in a moment he was normal. The whole family knelt around the bed and said prayers of thanksgiving. For Father Bowdern, it looks like a triumph of good over evil. From the Rituale Romanum, a warning. Sometimes the devil will leave the possessed person in peace to make it appear that he's departed. The exorcist must be on his guard, lest he fall into this trap. Mom! Mom! It's 2 a.m. Mom! Father Bowden has been gone for an hour. Coming? He's coming back. Who? Who's coming? He's coming back. Uncle, At 3.15 a.m., Bowden is called back to Richard's bedside. His fight with the devil is far from over. Sunday, March 20th, from the journal. Richard went into his tantrum at 8.15 p.m. with more violence than on any previous occasion. It looks like the work of the devil. But on a purely medical level, there could be another explanation. The one thing that Richard might have had, besides being a prankster, the one medical condition he could have had could have been temporal lobe seizure. It's a form of epilepsy, chronic seizures caused by malfunctions in the brain's electrical activity. Patients with temporal lobe seizure can experience hallucinations and delusions. They can experience hyper-religious thought and hyper-philosophical thought. And in rare instances, they can act out in a violent manner. But do disease and the devil sometimes go hand in hand? Father Fortea, the Spanish exorcist, believes it is possible to be afflicted by seizures and possessed by demons at the same time. He has a warning for unbelievers. I 
can say to the people that uh, they are not sure about the existence of God, that if they will see the eyes of a possessed person, and they will see what is to have the eternity before you, the whole eternity, centuries and centuries, thousands of years and thousands of years before you, and no salvation. Novelist William Peter Blatty is also a believer. Once I was convinced the phenomenon was real, that's what gave me an almost fervor of dedication in making it real for the reader so that they could share the conviction that I had. The family can no longer deal with the ongoing nightmare. Father Bowden takes a drastic step advised in the Rituale Romano. If it can be done so conveniently, the possessed person should be led to some worthy place where the exorcism will be held away from the crowd. That worthy place is a Catholic hospital in St. Louis run by the Alexian brothers, an order of monks. Good morning, Father Bowden. Oh yes, Father, we're expecting you. Just down this corridor to the left, room 26. Thank you. He's taken to a special wing, one with locks on the doors and steel mesh in the windows. Richard is the newest patient in the psychiatric ward. It's as if the devil is dragging him down into madness. March 22nd, 1949. Just with the temperature drop and everyone's been sleeping. Good evening, Father. Good evening, Father. Father Bowdern calls up reinforcements in his battle with the devil. Walter Halloran, now retired in Wisconsin, is the only surviving eyewitness. In 1949, he is a young seminarian. His job. Hello, Richard. Restrain Hello, Richard buddy. during the exorcism. How are you feeling? I'm okay. Basically, I, all the way through the case, that was about what I did, was hold him. And then sometimes, you know, when they'd stop the prayers, I'd visit with him and talk to him. Before we started the prayers, he had a bottle of holy water that was about this big, and he blessed the, uh, blessed the boy with the holy water, and then he turned around and put it on a dresser. And then I was kneeling there at the foot of the bed, and all of a sudden this bottle whizzed by my head and crashed into the wall and fell down. And uh, that was the first clue that I uh, had that this was a uh, case of exorcism. Seven. Just saw you in hell. Cronium justus dominus. You fat ass, you ox. Richard, or the evil spirit in him, curses at the priests. The journal describes it as vile and dirty talk about genitals and masturbation. In 1949, it's shocking. But is it demonic possession or plain mischief? For Richard to bring up these topics during his possession is just another great way of him sticking his finger in the eye of all those around him. When else can you swear and curse people out without getting in trouble for it by saying that the devil made me do it? As the ordeal progresses, Richard becomes more and more obscene with Father Bowden. He asked if I ever thought that the child was faking his condition or his actions. 
Uh, no, I never did. There wasn't anything that he was doing at the time these seizures would take place that would indicate that, that he was uh, attracting attention or reveling in the attention that he uh, had attracted. The instructions in the old Roman ritual raise other doubts in Father Bowden's mind. Doubts about himself. Father Fortea, the Spanish exorcist, says he knows what Bowder must have been going through. I suppose that Father Bowder, at the first time, he was with fear, because when you do an exorcism for the first time, you have the fear that something can happen that you cannot expect. Anything can happen. From the journal, he fought and kicked and spit so that three men could scarcely hold him. He was complaining that I was hurting him by holding his arms and that sort of thing. So I let go of his arms and the minute I did that, he whacked me. Father, you are right. Please, Richard. What happened? It was nothing. I hurt myself. Richard seems oblivious. <laughs> For the family, the ordeal is excruciating. For the priests, it is exhausting. Richard's behavior worsens. From the journal, there were four or five such urinations during the evening. Sometimes we'd seem to be making progress. And then other times it was kind of depressing. We obviously weren't making any progress. Richard's thrashings become more violent every time Bowdern invokes the name of God. March 31st. Richard, or perhaps the devil in him, begins to communicate on paper. From the journal, Richard called for a pencil. What he wrote was, I am the devil himself. In 10 days, I will give a sign. What sign? Bowden doesn't know and isn't going to ask. The Roman ritual contains a strict rule. Never engage in conversation with Satan. Let's move. Bowden makes a decisive move. Richard. Richard, have you ever been baptized? I can't remember. Would you like to be baptized again? Baptism, the first sacrament of Christianity, is itself a form of exorcism. It is usually a joyous occasion. Richard's baptism will be a nightmare. Richard's confined to the psychiatric wing of a hospital. He seems to be getting worse. Father Bowdern, the exorcist, decides to bring out what he considers his most lethal weapon, baptism. Dost thou renounce? Bowdern asks the question again and again. 
Dost thou renounce Satan? Dost thou renounce Satan? I do renounce. Richard, I baptize thee in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. In the eyes of the Catholic Church, Richard is now safe in the presence of the Holy Spirit. But it seems that the devil isn't finished. From the journal, the usual spitting, gyrating, cursing, and physical violence continued until 11.30 p.m. Omni incursio adversary, omni fantasma, omni... Spanish exorcist Jose Fortea knows all too well what Father Bowden was going through. Fortea has been trying for two years to drive the devil out of a young woman. He says the woman had a relationship with a man who belonged to a satanic cult. He wanted her. More than love is sex. And he's completely obsessed with that lady and they invoke every every week to the demons he says it has turned into a spiritual tug of war we cast out some demons and they invoke some demons to come in the spanish exorcist sees a striking parallel with the 1949 case both involved summoning godless spirits. I have read that uh, there was a person of the family that did Ouija war. It is very, very dangerous to do Ouija war at, as any kind of witchcraft, of spiritism, of invocation of unknown spirits. If my soul or my consciousness is separable from my body, then this raises the possibility that something else could get in here and take control. So hence the idea of possession. And so, if you like, it's the kind of, it's the dark side of belief in the afterlife, which in itself is generally, I think, a positive belief. Whether or not it's something that is true is a very positive thing to believe because it helps us to cope with our anxieties about our own mortality. After Richard's baptism, a period of calm days, with Richard helping out around the hospital. Sitting here reading by yourself. Well, you know what? But the nights with the praying time, priests are another matter. <laughs> April 11th, 1949. Father Bowden and his assistants arrive at the hospital at 8 p.m., weary but determined to press on with the exorcism ritual. Hello, Father. How are you feeling? I'm fine. The rosary? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Oh. Uh. Richard, what is it? Gouged into his oh chest in capital letters, the word exit. The devil now seems to speak directly through Richard. From the journal, the devil laughed and said, he has to say one more word. He'll never say it. Say one more word, but he'll never say it. We were puzzling, trying to figure out what that could possibly be. And uh, finally figured out that the word was Lord. 
The priests invoke the Lord's name again and again, Richard becoming more and more agitated, even delirious. The journal states that Richard now sees a vision of St. Michael the Archangel. Oh, it burns! Through Richard, the angel's voice breaks into the prayers. Satan, it's St. Michael, and I demand you, Satan, and the other evil spirits to leave the body in the name of Dominus, immediately, now, now, now! Richard later describes seeing the devil wrestling an angel at the mouth of a fiery cave. The angel prevails, and the devil retreats into the flames. He's gone. receives communion from Father Bowden. Soon after, a powerful blast is heard throughout the hospital. No one feels shockwaves, and there is no sign of an explosion. And the people across the street in the church heard it, and then all the lights went out, and then they came back on and Richard sat up and he said he's gone. Bowdern takes the strange phenomenon as a sign that the devil has left Richard's body. On April 19th, after 28 continuous nights of exorcism, Richard goes home. Was it real? Was Richard delusional? Perhaps it was all a prank. I suspect at the end of the day, we've got one of the cases that seems to have gone down in history as being a classic case of possession and exorcism. But when you look more closely at the case, it appears it's built on very, very flimsy evidence indeed. April 29th. 1949. Richard's month-long ordeal Eight. is over. One, two, three. Back home, mom and dad watch for signs of demonic possession. There are none. Richard behaves like a normal boy. The devil, it seems, has gone home to hell. Three. Three. Father Bowden returns to his pastoral duties and does not discuss the exorcism. Years later, author William Peter Blatty, preparing to write his book, The Exorcist, corresponds with Father Bowdern. The priest refuses to meet him in person. He said, the only thing I can tell you is that the case that I was involved in was the real thing. I had no doubt about it then. I have no doubt about it now. I'm convinced that the situation of uh, Richard and the things that he went through was all genuine. That there wasn't any uh, deception uh, on his part. But others suggest Richard created the fantasy of demonic possession, a fantasy fueled by his family with its belief in spiritualism and the priests with their rites of exorcism. It's quite possible in these cases, the priests themselves don't realize how influential their own behavior is in shaping what's actually going on. But what about the journal and its meticulous reports of shaking beds and flying objects? We know from mountains of research on the reliability of eyewitness testimony that, in general, eyewitness testimony is not that accurate. The messages on Richard's skin were they the work of the devil or self-inflicted? Writing on the skin is called dermatographia, and it supposedly can occur in heightened states of uh, anxiety. So just 
pulling, just moving their fingernail across their own skin or any object, a pen, a thorn, it, it will make a welt raise up and it looks like a kind of a bas relief form of writing on the skin. But why would he do this? Could he have been simply seeking attention? I believe that the entire situation started off probably as innocent pranks of a 14 year old but then when the Catholic Church and the priest got involved he thought he had to run with this story the really probing question is not whether or not this 1949 case was the real thing I don't know of course I don't know the question though is could it have been the real thing isn't that interesting Word of the exorcism soon leaks out, leading to newspaper stories and, for the priests, unwanted public attention. After it was over, they got a lot of crazy phone calls. They, uh, some of the woman who wanted her husband exercised, and someone wanted their dog exercised. Christmas, 1973. The exorcist is released and one Catholic church in Washington receives 40 requests for exorcisms. Richard, the boy who started it all, converted to the Catholic church, became a scientist, and now lives in the eastern United States. He is said to have no recollection of the events of 1949. Father Bowdern died in St. Louis in 1983 at the age of 86. He never spoke publicly about the exorcism. Halloran served as an army chaplain in Vietnam, taught at university, then became a parish priest. He retired in 2003. I'm not really an expert in the field. And uh, I just looked at it. This is the situation that's confronting us, and we're using prayer to uh, alleviate it, and uh, it worked. In 1999, 385 years after the Rituale Romanum was written, the Vatican issued revisions, cautioning priests to ensure that they are not dealing with physical or mental illness. If you believe in the devil and you see the devil, therefore there must be a God or we're all in trouble.